Hello and welcome to Chess Please. Today I'm going to be talking about my opening repertoire as an 1800s player on chess.com just to let you know how little opening prep you need to actually reach some of those higher echelons of rating points. So I'm going to be going through my opening repertoire for 1e4 and the different variations there against the Carol Khan, against the French, against the Sicilian and against 2e5. So sort of four branches of 1e4. I'll talk through the responses that I play against 1e4 when I have the black pieces, against 1d4, and against everything else as black, which, spoiler alert, is exactly what I play against 1d4. Let's jump on in. Now, typically, you will either be a 1e4 or a 1d4 player, or else you play some sort of freak opening that I am not going to cover. Uh, if you are a 1d4 player, I recommend the Kali system. I'm not a 1d4 player, but any time I have played 1d4 for the laugh, uh, I do play the Collie system and I've had a lot of good times with that so I'll link out the video I've made on the Collie system here but today I'm going to be covering my 1e4 openings uh, and let's jump in. So against 1e4 e5 which is probably the most typical one uh, I play my beloved Vienna game specifically the Vienna gambit and that goes a little something like this e4 e5 knight to c3. Now the Vienna Gambit comes about, and this is where I really like playing the Vienna, but it doesn't always go like this, uh, where they bring their knight out here, you bring your pawn out here, little Gambarino, if they take, you're already winning. You're already winning at this point. One of the reasons I love this, people get wise up the ratings ladder, but sometimes they don't, sometimes they just take it. You push here, the knight has absolutely nowhere to go, so it generally, like, its best move is actually back here. You develop this knight here, you always want to make sure that that knight sits there because this check becomes very pesky, very pesky indeed. Uh, if they want to waste time defending the pawn here, they're absolutely at liberty to do so. They, they don't really, they tend to like maybe do something like this. And then you develop here, you get a beautiful pawn center. You're very likely to win this pawn back and you know, if they start to bring out their queen or anything like that, which they often do to kind of stop this from like pay, taking a knight here or something like that uh, you can jump your knight in here a ton of different ideas with the vienna game the purpose of this video isn't to go into the depths of the knowledge of this um not that i have a deep knowledge of this i have a deeper dive on the vienna game i'll link it here but this is the general shape of the vienna gambit that i play if they don't accept the gambit so we go here they might play d5 and then i would generally like take here they'll do something like this you still want to plant your knight here because the queen is going to come in like a freight train and it's even more dangerous with the knight here and you know even sometimes they might even try to double up and get a nice little double fork eno here uh i think the best move here is queen e2 where you're actually trying to choke down on this knight straight away and you know whether or not they defend it sometimes they'll just take here if they take here happy days you just do something like this. You've got a nice little cubby hole here, nice little housing for your bishop. You want to get your queen out of the way. There's a bit of untangling in this. I don't necessarily love it when it goes this way, which it does. Um, but that's that's the Vienna that I play. And after this, I'm pretty much out of book. There's certain traps you want to avoid, like a lot of kingside attacks can happen early on. But overall, pretty solid here. And you end up with a really nice attack. Once you're able to get castled, of the rook facing down here, your bishop might end up here, your other bishop might end up here, queen can find herself over here sometimes after a couple of moves. It's a good time, it's a good time. That's the Vienna, so that's 1e4e5, e e that is my response, the Vienna game, if they let me, the Vienna gambit. So if they don't allow the Vienna gambit, so let's say they go for something like this, and you bring your knight out here, if they actually bring their knight out this way, Generally, I go for a scotch game. I try to transpose into a scotch where they go like something like this. They bring out their knight here. Four knights. A four knight scotch is what this is called. We get this nice little pawn center. They'll take here. They'll take here. They'll do any number of things. They'll maybe do like this. And almost always I'm looking to take this knight at some stage. Do a little bit of damage to their pawn structure. And then we just develop and we have a game of chess. So it's no disaster if they don't really allow the Vienna Gambit, that's the Vienna game. Okay, next up, let's look at what I play against the Karo Khan. Now, I have made videos on this before. This is my favorite opening to play in chess, and it's probably the worst, quote unquote, opening that I play. The computer thinks it's the worst, but I just love what it does to the game. 
So I play e4 and a Karo can again is where they play c3 here. I work away with d4. I just want to claim as much of the center as possible. Very standard Karo can stuff here. They eventually play d5. I bring out my knight, so I just sort of like prompt them to take here. It, it almost never happens that they don't take there. If not, I probably will play the advanced or something like that. But it, it, it really doesn't come up that often where they don't take there. So they'll take here. And this is where the Rasa Studier Gambit comes into effect, where we give them another little pawn there. Why not? Uh, our F pawn, no less. One of the worst pawns to move early in the game. They take, they take, and then there's a couple of different things that they can do. Uh, a very often fallen into trap happens when they bring their knight out. We bring their bishop out onto, or bring our bishop out onto a nice long diagonal. And the trap they fall into is sometimes they're like, well, if you're bringing your bishop out, I'm going to bring mine out and I'm going to pin it to your queen. That's incorrect. That's not what's going to happen because the trap happens here. We say check. They take another little check there. They can either go here. If they go here, they're in they're in big trouble because they go bang. We take their bishop. We're up a piece. They take our knight. We take their knight. They can do any number of things. Oftentimes they'll do something like this. And then that's checkmate right there. That happens maybe a quarter of the time that i played this opening even in the 1700s 1800s people just don't know this prep which is listen it's a little bit tricky trappy cheesy whatever but it happens listen you you should know not to fall into this what will normally happen is at this point uh where i bring out my bishop that you'll get to this point quite a lot i'll bring out my bishop and they just do that that's they're they've stopped that okay all it takes is a little e6 maneuver but that's fine and this is where I kind of really, this opening comes into its own for me. At the start when I was playing this, I was like, if they don't fall into the trap, I'm going to resign straight away. But now I'm like, great. Now we have a really bloodthirsty game because what we do is we castle. They might do any number of different things as well. They might try to block us here. Um, one little maneuver I like to do is just bring our pawn out here. Basically, because I want to stop the knight from coming in here because I want to get my bishop here a very oft fallen into trap on the other side of things is if you don't protect this pawn if your queen moves away which i do want to move my queen away the queen takes here with check so remember we've moved our f pawn as part of this rasa studio so just keep that in mind uh so often i'll bring i'll move my knight they'll castle uh or move my pawn they'll castle and i bring my bishop out here the reason we have the pawn here is because i want to stop knight in here forcing our bishop or like forcing a trade of bishops um so we can keep contact with this pawn here uh again they might want to develop in any number of different ways could be something like say for example this then i would like to do this i like to get my queen on this diagonal on the dark squares diagonal Maybe they'll fianchetto their bishop or something like that. They'll develop in a different way to this. That's fine. Something like this. They'll develop their bishop maybe differently to this. I like to tuck my bishop back in here. Once this pawn has been played, I do waste a tempo to get my bishop from this diagonal over to this one. And now what you're starting to see is we have a really feisty attack coming up our sleeves here. So this can, this can turn pretty ugly pretty quick for black. Um, and... It is a little bit of a hell for leather, all or nothing attack. I will say, like, you are giving away, like, a lot of positional stuff. Like, your king's pretty flimsy if you don't win this early on. Um, but you can often win back a piece or win a queen or a rook often uh, when this attack does start to kick off. And sometimes the knight will move in here or in here. This knight is a bit of a sacrificial lamb. I almost always trade off any like a knight advance onto these light squares this knight sometimes he gets into the attack most of the time he's here to stop to just trade off there i'm like that's a better knight than this guy trade him off and we're good to go um eventually you will probably look to like double your rooks on this file to like deliver the hammer blow but you get into just a beautiful kingside attacking game that is the rasa studio again that gambit and it happens like so you get into a carol can they take that piece, you sling out your f-pawn, they take that, you capture it with the knight. So again, you get a developmental advantage. They develop, you bring out your bishop. If they bring out their bishop here, 
their goose because you can do this and then this bring the queen out here all sorts of messing goes on and they're you're likely going to win that one uh, they'll do this you drop your bishop back you castle you bring your queen onto the e-file you bring your bishop here and you just rain down fire on the king side that's the rasa studio that's my response to the carol can now next up we have my response to the French defence and this is the defence I hate playing against the very most. It is really annoying. I don't think I'm alone in that in hating playing against the French. So I found a gambit that is pretty bloodthirsty and again super risky but a lot of fun to play against the French. So the French go something like this. E4. They do a little E6 manoeuvre. Uh, we go D4. We go D4. They come out with D5. I play the advanced French, which is where you sort of like mesh them in. You don't trade off. You leave the tension there. And almost always you'll see something like this where they play c5. And I like to defend it with my c-pawn. They'll bring out their knight. I'll bring out my knight. They'll bring out their queen here. This happens like a lot, a lot. This is the main stuff that happens in the French. And this is where it kind of kicks into the Rasa Studio where I drop my bishop here. Now... There is a very cheap, cheesy trick that happens here. This is the Milner Barry Gambit. A very cheap, cheesy trick that happens here that they won't fall into after a while, but depending on your level, they'll fall in where they're thinking, okay, well, they've got one, they've got two, they've got three attackers, and you've got one, two defenders. So what can happen, this is a very well-known trick, so it won't happen forever, but they'll go bang, you go bang, you go bang. You go, oh no, and they're like, wait, you're out of defenders, they'll take your knight, and you're like, ah, sorry, <laughs> that's check, and I'm going to take your queen on the next move, like so. So they'll go like, bang, you can even like take there if you want, and then dush, oh yeah, bang, bush. So you win straight away if that happens. That isn't going to happen that often, because people who play the French know that trick, but you still place your bishop here. They preempt it by placing their bishop there, that's very common, and now... The, the threat is real where you're like, okay, you have three attackers, I've only got two defenders. And the gambit really comes into its own when you just castle there. You just sort of ignore it. You maybe let them think you missed it. Uh, so then they go bang. All this happens the same. Big old trade down. Bang, bang, bang. Queen takes here. And that's they've won a pawn there. That's part of the gambit. This gambit actually is a two-pawn, a twofer, a two-pawn gambit where you bring out the knight here this pawn is undefended and very often they will take this. They're like, of course I'm going to absolutely obliterate their centre. Who wouldn't? Who wouldn't in today's economy? You bring out your rook and this is where you can really start to up the firepower a little bit. Weirdly enough, there is only a couple of decent moves here for black because if they play something like d5 here, uh, you can kind of get back to equality where you go something like this. Knight hits the queen. Oops, knight hits the queen. Uh, generally they'll take, you take back with your bishop. They give up casting rights in some way or another. They generally like move something like this. And like pretty soon you have a king trapped in the center. You can bring your bishop out here and then bring your rook here. And then you really control like this diagonal. Uh, the king is like in quite a lot of trouble here. So this is just a really fun position to play. Again, you are down two pawns. So attack is the name of the game. But having the, when it does shake down like this, let's go like this. You go like this, yada yada, uh, maybe something like this. What, having these three amigos on the CD and E file with a king trapped in the center, it just makes for fun games. Like, oftentimes you'll see like mistakes happen like this, where they bring their knight across, and then you can take the bishop here, and it's it's just really fun. You can take the pawn there, I should say. Um, so that is the Milner Barry Gambit. It's that's one move if they move their queen here. If they move their queen here, a very common mistake. Notice and a big part of this Milner Gallery. Notice that a big part of this Milner Barry Gamut working is taking this knight. This pawn is pinned until they put something here, some sort of timber there, uh, because you have your rook here. So the queen is then attacked, has to move again, and like back here is like the only move that doesn't lose. And the knight is safe here for the time being. And if you look, we are two pawns down. We're actually only one pawn down now to claim this one back. This is a miserable out king side. And we're about to complete our development. We're already castled. Our bishop is going to come in here with serious tempo on this square here. Like, let's say they bring their rook across. We bring our rook. Um, maybe they trade off, something like that. We do this. 
and there's really not a great way to stop our rook coming in here and then a queen can come in here and start to threaten like mate so it it gets really messy for black very quickly uh other options where the queen can move here believe it or not the qu the computer likes best queen b8 and uh, players at the 1800 level are not fine in queen b8 so they need to have studied this quite a lot you can still take this pawn this pawn is still trapped um i guess I, i'm not even sure what the point is of this like that is better than you know other moves that we've done i'm not even sure like where black's why this is so much better having the queen back here i guess the queen doesn't get jerked around as much but ultimately you do end up with the three amigos here your bishop oftentimes on this diagonal because now the knight protects there uh it's a it's a it's a whale of a time once you do get it going so very similar to the rasa studio there are ways out of the milner barry gamut probably a lot of them ha happen at this point where if they like don't step into this uh big reduction here but most players do, and that's been enough to help me start enjoying playing against the French. I am open to recommendations against the French, by the way. This is a super risky opening, so um, I, hit me up, hit me up, let me know. That is our response to the French defence. Onward. So the last opening that I have prepared for e4 is 1e4 plays 2c5, the Sicilian opening. Now, the Sicilian is quite an annoying opening to face because it is a multi-headed serpent. There are so many different nooks and crannies and very theoretically rich ways that you can go down, different blind alleys you can go down. So I like to take the sting out of a lot of that by playing the Alapin, which starts with c3 here. The correct response for black is either knight to f6, in which case you annoy it a little with the pawn. They might move in here, you move in here, Basically, if they ever take here, we take back and we free up this square for our knight. That happens, happy days, like, we've kind of taken the sting out of the Sicilian. We've traded, how it's worked out, we've traded a C-pawn for a C-pawn. Whereas a lot of the time, the Sicilian player is looking to trade, you know, their C-pawn for your D-pawn, which is obviously much more favourable to get a centre pawn for a wing pawn. We just traded off two wing pawns here. We have a really nice centre. They have a slight lead in development, but we're going to get our pieces untangled. So that's one sort of like quick collapse down of the Alapin. If they don't play knight f6, oftentimes they'll play d5 straight away. Again, we want to take. We don't want to lose our e-pawn, first and foremost. Um, they will take with the queen here. We kind of want to just continue with our plan. We can push our pawn out. They might bring their knight out. We bring our knight out. And this is kind of where my, my theoretical knowledge sort of dies a little uh, they'll probably bring their knight out here. Sometimes we can just develop our bishop, get ready to castle. Um, you know, they might do the same like this. And we get castled. And we just have a game of chess. It's not as clean cut, but it's also not as like fiery as a lot of Sicilians. I think we've taken kind of a lot of the sting out of that. They take here, they take here, they take here, take here. If they take here, it's game over. So that can happen. Uh, it doesn't happen oftentimes, but it's just a nice, like, small nuggets of theory against the Sicilian. Now, honourable mention, because all of the rest of my openings were gambits, and I do love playing gambits. I just like these really feisty attacking games, and it feels cool to give up material in exchange for, like, an attack. I really want to learn a little bit more about where we play 1e5, c5, 2d5, the Smith Mora. I honestly do love playing this. I played a little bit in Blitz and Bullet. I don't quite know it well enough yet to play at uh, maybe the higher level. But you do something like this. They take here. You develop the knight. They need to be pretty precise with what they do. Because we're going to get our pieces untangled super quickly. And put a lot of pressure on the king. Uh, so I think they need to do this. We'll bring our other knight out. Uh, they can bring their knight out. We'll bring our bishop out here. Um, do, 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 do. They kind of actually want to make sure that we don't bring our knight in here. Because that can get very messy early on. Uh, we will castle, they can do, 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 do. They can also just play something like this. We put our queen here to defend the bishop. Uh, maybe they bring this guy in here. Our bishop can probably land itself over here, something like that. Let's see if that's is that what the computer likes. Uh, computer also likes this, which is fine. 
and then depending on how you want to develop you get your knight here uh, this uh, and you get your rook here so we have given away a pawn but we now have all of our pieces developed and we have them kind of corralled in the center playing against the smith mora i really really hate it and you'll see why i don't know like a, a huge depth of theory on this but i know this is the setup for white two rooks here the queen defending the bishop the knight here often sacrifices itself on that d5 square i believe to kind of open up things this bishop can kind of wreak havoc over on this side of things i know playing against the smith mora i have been caught with my pants down quite a bit where i just don't know the theory and they have so much attacking juice going on so that is what i want to learn a little bit more of at the moment i'm playing the alapin which is a little bit drier but i think in keeping with my playing style the smith mora is where we want to go so any recommendations on getting up to speed on the smith mora let me know okay so that is my repertoire for white we now turn to when i have the black pieces and I really only have two openings that I play here. So against one e4, I play the Sicilian. I bring them into my own house. I play like an e6 version of the Sicilian. It's kind of like a, a Taimanov is the name of it. I actually thought I was playing the Taimanov for quite a while until I read up on the Taimanov. And what I was playing was not quite that. But sometimes the analysis says I'm playing a Taimanov. Uh, so there's any number of ways that I can respond to this. But generally, we are going to do uh, get our knight out to c6. Depending on how they develop, we are going to play something like e6. So e6 is kind of a key part of all of my Sicilian stuff. Uh, when they bring out their pawn, never let their pawn get here. So I always just take their, take our d with the c, um, take their d with our c. And once we have our knights here, oftentimes I like to, actually, first and foremost, I develop this knight out here. We get a nice little four knights variation here. They might bring their bishop out here actually happens quite often and i like to pin this knight here because if they do well, yes if they block with the bishop surprise surprise they actually give up this knight that happens quite a lot so they'll just do this queen is no longer defending this central knight you can win that knight for free that happens loads that actually does happen quite a bit which is strange because that's kind of a pretty basic mistake that happens quite often uh if they don't do that let's say for example They'll probably just castle here i'll often just kind of take here take take like that and we're actually up a pawn there so that that's a nice little uh shenanigan so a lot of speaking of a lot of shenanigans come from having this knight pinned and this knight being the only defender of their e pawn so the good thing about this e6 sicilian is it is a very flexible system there isn't really a ton of extra theory certainly not that i've learned and that's probably evident by what i'm showing here um but generally these are the homes for the pieces that i like to pick where you know we just get castled let's say they castle and we castle here um so bishop pinning these knights ready to take that at a moment's notice to claim our center pawn in here oftentimes they will try to block or maybe they'll develop their bishop to here in which case you can kind of claim that knight in the center in the time and of and why mine kind of departs oftentimes the like defining feature of a time and of sicilian is when you have that queen on c7 i haven't been doing that um it is kind of pretty thematic for a sicilian to start attacking down the c file i generally tend to find that this like kind of center minor piece play tends to shape the game before i have a chance to put my queen onto c2 maybe that's a failing in terms of how i'm playing it the point of this video is kind of just highlight what i actually do play rather than the perfect version of what i play uh so that's the time enough to sitting that's what i play against one e4 and it, it lets me kind of drive the bus in terms of what's happening there uh, against one d4 uh this again you're looking into a little bit more of a, like a drier closed position i have done a video very recently on the benko gambit which really good a lot of fun sometimes we'll maybe touch on that a little bit more but actually what I play is the boring old d5 and if we get a queen's gambit or pretty much anything else we play the queen's gambit declined very dry very pasty but we just get our pieces out we don't really worry about too much we get our knight here a uh, fun little trap that you'll find here is again if they say okay well we've got two attack oh sorry yeah we've got two attackers two defenders but one of those defenders is pinned so sometimes white thinks okay great I'll take here we take here we'll take we'll win the pawn I'll take the knight and be like, oh no, my queen. Uh, but then you can go like this. And you'll, oh no, their queen. Straight back. 
So you take here, they take, uh, king takes here is great. And we're off to the races. We're up a piece very early on. That doesn't happen too often, but when it does, it's great. That's called the elephant trap. But what does happen very often is you get to this position, then they'll maybe do this. I will generally jump on in with something like this, but I don't even know if that's pretty good. It's a quite a hungry downy sort of opening where we're not too expansive, first and foremost. Oftentimes trying to make this C pawn break um, and play along the queen side, get our king castle. Just be nice and sturdy. Let the attack come on to you a little bit on the king side with like the knights over here. You generally should be fine. Try to get some counterplay on the queen side. That's generally what happens. And what I do is I, for better or for worse, I generally play this setup against whatever white does with d5. So that's again, you know, there's like the, the London, I believe, starts out with d5. I generally play something like this, for better or for worse. I don't think it's for better, but it just saves me having to learn other systems with black. So again, this is an open call. If there are any systems that you want to play or that you think I should play as black, King's Indian, I've tried a little bit, but I am just a little late to the party. I just need to do the legwork on that. But that is the entirety of my opening repertoire. If you've made it this far, you'll see a lot of these pretty flimsily covered. Like, it's definitely not, like, a crazy amount of depth. Most of what I've learned is by playing it wrong, going back and doing my analysis, and then getting told what's right. So I think that, that is my general recommendation. These openings are a ton of fun, and that's kind of kind of a curated, a, a fun first sort of opening. Queen's Gambit decline may be an exception to that, but I do like the gambits. I do like the very savage battles where you're trading off a lot of pieces, a lot of open games. Um, but you know the closed ones are fun sometimes too. Uh, I hope this was useful to you. I hope it was fun, and I hope maybe it's given you some inspiration as to some new openings to pick. Uh, that is going to be all from me. If you did have a good time or you're just interested in more chess content in general, feel free to like and subscribe and comment any other thoughts on the video. It would make my day and help grow the channel. And otherwise, have a great day and enjoy your chess. Thanks.